Now we're going to talk about audition and we're just going to scratch the surface here. A lot of the same principles that we talked about in the vision section apply in the case of auditory perception as well. You know, the main difference here is how the signal is transduced. So the signal is these vibrations, these kind of pressure waves, and uh, the raw signal is essentially the amplitude in terms of how big the change is in pressure across the wave. And then also the frequency, which tells us the pitch, low versus high sounds. Um, and and that those waves come in, they wiggle your eardrum. Your eardrum wiggles these little bones, these amazing tiny bones. The uh, end result being the pressure being transduced into a liquid uh, form in the cochlea. And this liquid is then better able to kind of move these little hair cells around and it's that movement of the hair cells that is actually turned into electrical signals, which then go up into your brain. And they, uh, the cochlea is organized so that uh, the higher frequency sounds end up being coded higher up, uh, further along, along this membrane. Um, and that's a principle of kind of frequency coding. It's also known as a Fourier transform in the signal processing world. Uh, and most uh, ways in which we process audio information involves that kind of Fourier transform, just like what's taking place in the cochlea. So that's kind of a physical Fourier transform taking place there. There are also a few, uh, you know, lower lo lower frequency signals that are processed uh, directly and encoded directly in terms of uh, the, the firing rates of neurons, but most of it is these kind of place code uh, where the information is encoded along the membrane. And you have remarkably few hair cells in the in the cochlea and once they're gone they're gone so that's why you want to really be careful with your hearing okay don't play things too loud and one of the interesting other facts about uh, the auditory system is that we are very sensitive to very very fine differences in timing when one sound hits the ear and then very very soon thereafter hits the other ear just due to a delay in the angle in which that sound is generated relative to our ears and uh, there's a very special subcortical set of mechanisms that are able to detect those really, really fine timing differences and turn those again into a signal that can be more easily coded as we go up into the brain. So there is a spatial signal similar to the depth signal, the binocular uh, depth signal that we have from our eyes. This is a binaural uh, uh, depth signal coming from the two ears. So the bottom line is that these illusions that we've been looking at uh, reveal the assumptions that are being made in those lower levels of the visual system and uh, show us how our brain creates this very simple interpretation of the world kind of automatically and effortlessly. This link is from uh, OK Go, and I recommend you click on that. It gives you two minutes at least, maybe five minutes, of nonstop illusions, one right after the other, uh, along with a jazzy soundtrack. Next, we're going to talk about spatial attention and how that interacts with our ability to recognize objects. And so spatial attention refers to this ability that you know from if you've done these Where's Waldo puzzles or any other kind of try to, you know, these games where you try to find things in these crowded scenes uh, and, you know, you, you can't sort of process the whole scene at the same time. You have to kind of focus in and focus that attentional spotlight on different parts of the scene. And then eventually you might actually find little Waldo there. Uh, and, um, and so this reveals a lot about the nature of our visual system. Another important insight into the visual system and the way that attention works comes from patients that have suffered from this phenomenon called hemispatial neglect. This is actually a relatively uh, high frequency uh, occurrence as a result of certain kinds of strokes that affect the parietal lobe. And it shows you how that uh, kind of wear pathway that we were just talking about in the parietal lobe uh, really interacts and, and focuses uh, your attention in different parts of space. This is a series of self-portraits uh, from a artist who suffered from this uh, stroke. And early on, you can see an overall effect of increasing kind of complexity uh, in the paintings. But early on, you can see there's nothing on the left-hand side of space and just the barest of details on the right-hand side. And then over time, slowly, things start filling in, right? But still, even in this 
uh, case where the, the patient is very much recovered, um, there's still sort of less detail on the left-hand side than the right-hand side. So some mild uh, lingering effect. Here we have a case where you're, you're supposed to bisect the lines exactly at the midpoint. Um, and you see two really interesting effects here. One is each line is uh, not s s bisected in the middle. And furthermore, there's a few lines over here on the very left side of the overall sheet uh, that are not bisected at all. And so you have a kind of neglect of the left-hand side of space overall, and then within each individual line, also a neglect of the kind of left-hand side of each individual line. So even over here, when you're focusing your attention on this individual line in the good side of space, you're still kind of shifting and ignoring the sort of left half of that line. And so that shows you that this kind of neglect thing can operate at multiple spatial scales, which is really interesting. Uh, here's another example, a very commonly used task where you have people kind of copy uh, well-known objects in the world. And what's really interesting here is, you know, you really think, well, why wouldn't the patient know that they're wouldn't that they aren't copying all the different numbers of the clock? Certainly, you would know there are these different, you know, twelve numbers on a clock. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that they actually do still neglect those uh, numbers, even with that kind of strong semantic knowledge of what should be there. So this shows us that this parietal uh, wear pathway can kind of help shine this attentional spotlight on the uh, visual information and help us process information kind of according to this uh, spatial spotlight of attention that we kind of introspectively see when we do that Where's Waldo task. Uh, one of the most widely used tasks to study spatial attention is known as the Posner spatial cueing task. Here you have time going down. And so uh, first you, you see uh, a display. So this is kind of one entire display that might be shown on a computer screen where one of these two boxes is highlighted. You're supposed to keep your eyes fixed on this fixation cross in the middle. And then shortly after that, that one side is highlighted, a target either appears at the same location or at the opposite location uh, relative to what was queued. So if it's the same location, it's a validly queued trial. Those are about 80% of the trials. And if it's an invalid location, invalidly queued trial, uh, then the idea is that you kind of have had your attention shifted over to the, to the queue side, but now you have to kind of shift it all the way back over to the other side and that should take some extra time. And that's exactly what you see here in the reaction time display. Uh, you're fastest when the queue and the target show up in the same place. So your attentional spotlight, your internal attentional spotlight, again, your eyes are staying fixated on the cross. So it's this internal, what we call covert attentional spotlight that's focusing on, the, on this side of space, kind of allows you to process that target more quickly. And then you're more slowed when you have to sort of transition and move that attentional spotlight over to the other location on these invalid trials. And then there's a neutral case where you don't cue either side and the target just shows up and that's how fast you are if you haven't had any manipulation one way or the other. In addition, these neglect patients show a specific impairment associated with invalidly queued trials, specifically when that invalid queue, the target is shows up in their kind of neglected side of space. So they, they really have an extra hard time focusing their attention back over to that side of space that they tend to neglect. Lastly, we're gonna talk about psychophysics. And this is the application of basic principles, very simple uh, kind of measurement principles, sort of like physics uh, and uh, understanding the really most basic aspects of perception. And these include, for example, uh, what is the weakest stimulus that you could possibly detect uh, and that's the absolute threshold that we talked about at the start in terms of the different senses, like that candle at 30 miles on a clear night. The, the key point here is that uh, you, you have to establish kind of what does it mean to detect something. And so uh, just kind of arbitrarily, they choose a 50% response threshold. So if when the stimulus is present, you tend to see it about 50% of the time, uh, then that counts as kind of the uh, uh, absolute threshold that, that kind of just barely being able to see it. Uh, and then there's the just noticeable difference or JND, 
And this is a measure of difference comparisons between two stimuli, the relative uh, aspect of stimulus perception. And again, we use a kind of 50% threshold to say, uh, if you can detect that something's different than something else about 50% of the time, that's that uh, threshold uh, level of difference. And the key point here uh, from uh, psychophysics uh, attributable to uh, Weber is that the JND is proportional to the intensity of the stimulus. So what this means is that it's basically a percentage of the weight of the kind of heaviest stimulus, let's say, if you're weighing two objects that, that uh, you can detect. So if you have like two marbles and one is slightly heavier than the other, maybe the difference is a couple ounces and maybe that's enough for you to detect the difference between these two little marbles. But if you have these two really heavy bowling balls, it's much more difficult to tell the difference and you need several pounds of difference. And it turns out that that amount of difference between the two stimuli is proportional to the kind of, you know, average, let's say, uh, of the uh, stimulus intensity, the weight, uh, the brightness, whatever it is that you're measuring um, of those stimuli themselves. And so it's roughly like, you know, 10% or 5%. It's, it's a percentage of the raw strength or of the stimulus. And so that is fundamentally a contrast effect. It's a relativity kind of effect. It's exactly what we expect from neurons where you have that balance or tug of war between the excitation and inhibition. It's kind of a, a poster child of that principle in the, in the Weber law. And you see these Weber laws everywhere you look. It's, it's very common throughout the brain. And again, reflecting those basic properties of neurons. And then finally, we have signal detection theory. Uh, this is another widely used paradigm within psychophysics and applied you know, across psychology. And it's just a way of characterizing uh, if you have a signal and you have a response, what is the relationship? So if the signal is there and you respond, we call that a hit. Um, if the signal is there and you don't respond, that's a miss. Um, if you have the signal not there and you respond anyway, that's a false alarm. And finally, if the signal is not there and you don't respond, that's a correct rejection. And so this diagonal here is kind of the accuracy, the accurate responses, and then the off diagonal here is the inaccurate responses. And you can use the percentages of responses in each of these categories to compute something called a D prime, which tells you how sensitive you are to uh, the presence or absence of that signal. And so that D prime is used in every kind of different paradigm, including memory and all sorts of different domains. Uh, so you'll see this throughout psychology, even though it was developed for psychophysics.